Part 1. I arrived in Delhi one nippy morning in October 1996 with a rucksack in which I had put two sets of clothes and several books including a well-thumbed copy of Irving Stone's Lust for Life that I very nearly knew by heart. The bus that had brought me from Jammu stopped at the Red Fort and suddenly, I felt very vulnerable. I thought this city would suck me into its dark underbelly, it would swallow me whole. I was one of the thousands of migrants who landed each day at the doorstep of India's capital from every crevice and corner of the country. Like most migrants, I had also come to Delhi in search of a better life, to regain some of what my family had lost during the exodus from the Kashmir Valley. But there was a difference between the other migrants and me. On festivals, and on family functions, or when they were dying, they knew they could go back to where they had come from. I couldn't do that. I knew I was in permanent exile. I could own a house in this city, or any other part of the world, but not in the Kashmir Valley where my family came from. The sense of vulnerability soon left me as I made friends, and fell in love, and wrote 40 page letters to beloveds until the early hours of the morning, when electric motor pumps would be switched on in the water deprived Punjabi colonies inhabited by those who had fled Pakistan after partition. I ate my first pizza, drank my first whiskey. A few years later when my parents joined me after leaving Jammu, I would come home drunk, sometimes way past midnight, and speak in English to my father who would open the door for me. He never spoke to me about it, but when he felt my accent was getting stranger, he would ask my mother to tell me to go easy on the Coca-Cola. That phase is over. I now insist on carrying my own key. But even now, when I come home, my father coughs from inside his room. He won't sleep until I return, whatever the time. There are no more 40-page letters. All that remains of those days is a plastic bag containing bracelets, photographs with lipstick marks on their backs, and my old copy of Lust for Life. There is also an old issue of the Daily Excelsior newspaper that every Kashmiri pundit subscribed to in Jammu because it informed them of who of the community had died in exile. I hardly ever open it. But, sometimes, when I'm angry at the TV shows where our murderers speak about our return, I do. On its front page is a picture of Ravi's mutilated face. The blood from his nose the result of a blow from the butt of a Kalashnikov has dried up. His forehead still looks beautiful and clear, and so does his mustache that I had wanted to imitate when I was young. It is then that the voices come back to me. The loud clapping. The jeering. The chants reaching a crescendo. The hiss of the loudspeaker. The noise beats hard on my chest, like a drum beat gone berserk. My head feels like an inferno, and a cold sweat traverses down my back. Hum kia chayot as what do we want free Edom? Once I was with a few non-Kashmiri friends, and one of them was enacting a scene he had witnessed in video footage shot early in 1990 in Kashmir, a mammoth crowd in Lal Chowk, shouting, Indian dogs go back. And hum kia chat as a die. It made all of them laugh. To me, it brought back memories of the kicks I had braved in school while I sang the national anthem. But in gatherings like these, my friends shouted for Azadai just for fun. For them it was just a joke the sight of a crowd clenching fists, demanding freedom in a funny accent. Before I had improved mine, my friends would make fun of me as well. Look at our friend here, he doesn't live in Bharat, he lives in Bharat. Tonight, he will go to his gar, not gar. I would laugh with them, making fun, in turn, of some of them for their inability to use the nutta, the small dot that makes Hayaj what it is, Hayaj. But this word, Azadai, it frightens me. Images of those days return to haunt me. People out on the roads. People peering out of their windows. People on the rooftops of buses. In Shikaras. And in mosques. Hum kia chayat Azadiyeth. I no longer sing the national anthem. A few years ago, a child beggar at a traffic signal pinned the national flag onto my shirt. I threw it away in the waste bin of a cafe near my house. It was the day I realized I could no longer remember my mother's voice. 
When she could still speak, Ma would go for walks in the neighborhood park in Delhi, wearing her North Star sneakers. Father would watch her close the door quietly behind her and, after she was gone, he would call after her, knowing very well that she could no longer hear him. For God's sake, don't repeat your home story in front of everyone. The home story was a statement that Ma had got into the habit of telling anyone who would listen. It didn't matter to her whether they cared or not. It had become a part of herself, entrenched like a precious stone in the mosaic of her identity. By the time her voice had failed her in 2004, I noticed that she had started repeating this statement much too often. But now, when I no longer remember her voice, I realize how much that statement meant to Ma. It was the only thing that reminded her of who she was, more than the occasional glances she would steal at the mirror when no one else was looking. Our home in Kashmir had 22 rooms. I remember the day when I realized I had no memory of her voice. That morning I had been reading the newspapers like I did every day. I would read a report or two, and Ma would point out advertisements of houses for sale. There were many of them. Book now, pay later. Wooden flooring. Uninterrupted power supply. Ten minutes drive from the airport. The last one was my mother's favorite. When she could still speak, she would pick up the papers while I was brushing my teeth or shaving, and she would show them to me and say, See, this one is close to the airport. Ma never got to fly in her life. But she thought proximity to the airport was important to her son. That morning I sat beside Ma's bed with the papers perched on my lap. I looked at the advertisements for the apartments, then at Ma. Her eyes were open, though hazy with tears that would streak their corners. Her gaze was fixed at the ceiling above her. The thought crossed my mind that she was counting something, perhaps she was calculating our days and years in exile. I don't know what happened to me then, I just got up and ran out. I tried to remember how she would comment after sifting through the descriptions of her dream houses. I tried hard. I tried to remember what she would say after discovering flakes of tobacco in the pocket of my white shirt, which she insisted on washing with her own hands. I tried to repeat her voice in my head when she would wake up at midnight after I came home from work or after meeting friends, to serve me piping hot food, curious about how my day had gone. None of it came back to me. No matter how hard I tried, I drew a blank. The words were there, but the texture, tone, and contours of her voice had gone missing. They were lost to me forever. I could not even remember what she sounded like when she chanted what had become her personal anthem for more than a decade. Our home in Kashmir had 22 rooms. I remember pressing my foot over a cockroach in desperation as it tried to crawl away. We don't know for certain where my ancestors originally came from. But in all probability they traveled from the plains of Punjab to settle in the Kashmir Valley, in the lap of the Himalayas, roughly 3,000 years ago. They took the same route to enter Kashmir as their future generations took many times to escape from there, mostly due to religious persecution. The land where they settled had been a lake. The valley had emerged out of this body of water due to a geological event, most probably an earthquake. My ancestors made it home gradually, building a legend around their settlement. They said that the vast lake that Kashmir had been before they settled there was inhabited by a demon called Jalad Baba. He had been granted immortality so long as he remained underwater. It was then that one of our gods drained the lake, sending Jalad Baba into hiding over a hill. Ultimately, our patron goddess assumed the form of a bird and dropped a pebble from her beak that, before landing, turned into a big rock, killing the demon instantly. The land was abundant with nature's bounty, but geographically isolated. Perhaps under the spell of nature's magnificence, my ancestors took to the pursuit of knowledge. It is thus that Kashmir became the primeval home of the Brahmins, or Brahmans those who are conscious. We developed our own philosophy, our own way of life. We held that the world is real, as opposed to the other Hindu philosophy of the world being Maya, an illusion. For us, everything in this world was a manifestation of this consciousness. 
We rejected the otherness of God. We evolved a way of life that was distinct from the bell ringing, hymn reciting popular religion. We believed that the world was essentially a creative expression of Shiva, or consciousness. Thus everyone could become Shiva, irrespective of caste or gender. Kashmir is so beautiful, my grandfather used to say, even of it, are jealous of it. Not only of its beauty, but also of its contribution to art and scholarship. Arthur Anthony MacDonald, the great professor of Sanskrit at Oxford University, once remarked, history is the one weak spot in Indian literature. It is, in fact, non-existent. But the 12th century Kashmiri Pandit scholar, Kalhana, putting aside the Hindu question of existence being dream and delusion, penned the magnum opus, Rajadarangini, River of Kings, which is counted among the world's most extraordinary historical works. In the 10th century, the great Kashmiri Pandit scholar Abhinvagupta wrote 35 works, including Tantraloka, a treatise on Kashmiri Shaivism, and Abhinavabharti, a splendid commentary on the Natyasastra, the seat of the Indian performing arts. The 11th century Kashmiri Pandit poet K. Shimandra wrote Bradkatha Manjari, a collection of stories representing the lost tradition of Bradkatha, big story. From the same text, another Pandit scholar, Somadeva, prepared the famous Kathas Arit Sagara, Oceans of the Streams of Stories. The 11th century pundit poet Bilhana had a secret affair with the king's daughter. When it was discovered, he was thrown into prison and ordered to be executed by beheading. Even while facing the prospect of execution, he wrote poetry. It was in the darkness of prison that he wrote his Shrap and Chasika, the collection of 50 verses by a love thief. Many centuries earlier, Kashmiri scholars made immense contributions to Buddhism which came to Kashmir with the Emperor Azoka who extended his rule over Kashmir around 250 BC. It was in Kashmir that Buddhist scriptures were written in Sanskrit for the first time. The revered monk Gunavarman, who belonged to a royal family of Kashmir from the 5th century AD, refused the throne when it was offered to him upon the king's death as he had no interest in worldly matters, wishing only to spread the teachings of the Buddha. He traveled to Ceylon, Java, and China as well, propagating Buddhism. It was Kumarajava, a Buddhist monk, whose father was a Kashmiri pundit, who translated the Buddhist Lotus Sutra into Chinese in 406 AD. Guru Padme Samhava, or Rinpoche, who is also referred to as the Second Buddha, spent time in Kashmir, drinking from its knowledge reservoir. A pundit scholar, Ratnavaha, was assigned the task of rebuilding the circular terrace of the Psamyas Monastery in central Tibet, which was burnt down in the later part of the 10th century. In the early 11th century, a female pundit scholar called Lakshmi traveled to Tibet and taught a Nuttarayaga Tantra. It was in the 5th century in Tibet that a pundit scholar was given the honorary title of Bada which means someone who has learned. This name stuck. For the outside world, we were Kashmiri Brahmins or Pundits. But in Kashmir, we remained Bhattas, a derivative of Bada. But somehow the gods couldn't make peace with us. So they would wreak upon us disease, earthquakes, floods, famines and fires. And then they gave us rulers susceptible to greed, lust, and deceit. And savagery. 1400 years ago, a ruler called Mirakula is believed to have been traveling with his army through the Purpanjal mountain pass when an elephant slipped and fell into a ravine. The cruel king loved the cries of the falling elephant so much that he ordered a hundred elephants to be forced down the mountain. The two golden phases in Kashmir's history were during the reigns of Lalitaditya and Avantavarman. Lalitaditya ruled Kashmir for about four decades in the early 8th century AD. He was considered a great administrator, and among his achievements the building of the Sun Temple at Margund in South Kashmir is considered the greatest. It stands even today in spite of being ravaged by invaders, and is considered one of the most important archaeological sites in India. Of the temple, the British explorer Francis Young Husband wrote, The temple is built on the most sublime site occupied by any building in the world finer far than the site of Parthenon, or of the Taj or of ST. 
Peters. It is second only to the Egyptians in massiveness and strength and to the Greeks in elegance and grace. Avantavarman ruled Kashmir for about three decades from 855 AD. Under his rule, the people of Kashmir prospered. He built magnificent temples and Buddhist monasteries and offered patronage to learned scholars. From the 14th century onwards, Islam made inroads into Kashmir. Initially, it fused with local practices and evolved into a way of life rather than a strict, monotheistic religion. There is nothing that reflects this melding more than a Vak by Lal Ded, Kashmir's revered poetess saint. Shivchha Thali E Thali E Razan. Emozan Hai and Tamuzalman. God pervades every particle, every being. Don't distinguish between a Hindu and a Muslim. But towards the centuries end a fanatical ruler called Sultan Sikandar took over the reins of Kashmir and let loose a reign of terror and brutality against his Hindu subjects. He tried to destroy the Mardan temple but failed. He imposed taxes on Hindus and forbade them from practicing their religion. So much so that he came to be known as Butchakin the Idol Breaker. He and his ministers destroyed any Hindu texts they could find. It is said of him that the number of pundits he murdered was so large that seven mons of sacred thread worn by them were burnt. It was during Sikandar's reign that a cry escaped from the lips of the hapless pundits, to be spared the sword, and a batoaham, and a batoaham. I'm not a pundit, I'm not a pundit. During Sikandar's rule a large number of Islamic scholars flocked to the valley, many mosques were built and Islam gained influence in Kashmir. Sikandar was succeeded by his son Ali Shah. After him, his brother Zainal Abidin took over in 1420 AD, he proved to be a tolerant ruler. Legend has it that by this time only 11 pundit families were left in Kashmir, the majority having either fled or converted to Islam. The historian Srivara, Zainal Abidin's court pundit and musician, described his rule as being, like the cooling sandal paste after the harsh summer heat in a desert. At the insistence of a pundit physician, Shribut, the king partially removed religious restrictions on the pundits. It is believed that the king suffered from a mysterious ailment that nobody could cure and that ultimately, it was Shribut who cured him. Upon his recovery, Zainal Abidin asked the physician to seek any gift he wanted from him. Shribut asked that all restrictions imposed upon his fellow pundits be lifted, and the king readily agreed. He extended an invitation to those pundits who had fled the valley to escape Sikandar's wrath. Many of them returned. He appointed many pundits as his administrators. Around the late 15th century, the Chucks, who were of Dardic descent, came to power. They belonged to the Shia sect of Islam and were intolerant towards both pundits and Muslims who belonged to the Sunni sect. In 1589, Kashmir was taken over by the Mughals. The Mughal Emperor Akbar visited Kashmir that same year. It was during his third visit to Kashmir in 1598 that two Europeans, Father Jerome Xavier and Benoist de Goyes, set foot in the valley for the first time. Akbar was succeeded by his son Jahangir who, enamored by Kashmir's natural beauty, built many gardens. At the time of his death in 1627 when Jahangir was asked what he desired, he replied, Kashmir nothing else. During Aurangzeb's rule, which lasted for 49 years from 1658 onwards, there were many phases during which pundits were persecuted. One of his 14 governors, Uftikar Khan, who ruled for four years from 1671, was particularly brutal towards the community. It was during his rule that a group of pundits approached the ninth Sikh guru, Teg Bahadur, in Punjab, and begged him to save their faith. He told them to return to Kashmir and tell the Mughal rulers that if they could convert him, Teg Bahadur, all Kashmiri pundits would accept Islam. This later led to the Guru's martyrdom, but the pundits were saved. From 1752 onwards, the valley slipped into the terrible misfortune of being ruled by Afghans for almost seven decades. In his book The Valley of Kashmir, Walter R. Lawrence writes of one of the Afghan governors, Asad Khan. It was his practice to tie up the pundits, two and two, in grass sacks and sink them in the Dell Lake. As an amusement, 
A pitcher filled with ordure would be placed on a pundit's head and Musulmans would pelt the pitcher with stones till it broke, the unfortunate Hindu being blinded with filth. During the rule of another governor, Adam Muhammad Khan, Lawrence writes, any Musulman who met a pundit would jump on his back and take a ride. During this tumultuous period, there were mass conversions. The Afghan rulers would surround a group of pundits with naked swords and ask them to convert. Those who did not comply would be put to death immediately. For the rest, a calf would be slaughtered, and they would be fed its meat and their sacred thread would be snapped. The troubles at home forced many pundits to migrate. Many took shelter in Delhi, Lucknow, Lahore, and Allahabad, among other places. It was one such family that produced India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. Following the period of Afghan rule, the valley passed into the hands of Sikh rulers in 1819, and then to the Dogra dynasty, who bought it from the British colonialists for 75, one horse, one horse, 12 goats, and three Kashmir shawls. The Dogra rulers were benevolent towards the pundits, but treated their Muslim subjects roughly. Many Muslims were forced to work as unpaid laborers. There was widespread discontent and anger towards the Dogra rulers. That anger also translated into violence against the pundits. In 1931, when a Muslim butcher vented his ire against the Dogra Maharaja outside Kashmir's central jail, his actions assumed the shape of a riot. A procession then stormed through Srinagar. It torched the Hindu shops in the burgeoning business center of Maharaj Ganjay. As the Freedom Procession marched on, the crowd stormed into the Vishar Nag area, about 9 kilometers from Maharaj Ganjay, and recklessly beat up Hindus. Some were killed as well. In 1947, at a time when the rest of the nation was ravaged with the violence of partition, Mahatma Gandhi saw the only ray of hope in Kashmir. But he saw that ray in the state's summer capital, Srinagar. In towns bordering Pakistan, Muzaffarabad, Baramala, Kupvara, the pundits had to wade through patches of darkness. The last Dogra Maharaja, Hari Singh, was reluctant to join India or Pakistan and wanted to remain independent for as long as possible. In October 1947, Pakistan sent tribal invaders from the northwest frontier province aided by Pakistani army regulars, to occupy Kashmir. In many places, they were aided and guided by Muslims in Kashmir. But at the last moment, when the valley was about to slip into the hands of the invaders, Maharaja Hari Singh signed the instrument of accession and Kashmir became a part of India. The Indian army arrived in Srinagar and the tribal invaders were pushed back. In 1948, the Kashmiri political leader Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, who had been a strong opponent of Dogra rule in Kashmir, made his pact with India by standing next to Jawaharlal Nehru and reciting a Persian couplet, Man tu shudi, tu man shudi, ta kas an agoid, man de gram tu degree. I became you and you became me, so nobody can think of us as separate. But this bonhomie was short-lived. The relationship between Sheikh Abdullah and Jawaharlal Nehru soured, and Kashmir and India remained at loggerheads with each other. Later, forgetting how many pundits had taken an active part in his struggle against the Dogra Maharaja, Sheikh Abdullah would also direct his bitterness towards the pundits, a community to which his own grandfather belonged, before he converted to Islam. He would tell pundits, Raliv, Khalif, Yagalib, be one among us, flee, or be decimated. Srinagar, early 1980s. Dada believed that Charlie Chaplin was the Englishman's god. She had a poster of him pinned up on a wall in her room, and sometimes I caught her looking at it with rapt attention, one hand clutching a corner of her muslin sari. Sometimes she would have an argument with a family member and afterwards, she would stand in front of it and mumble in complaint or prayer, I don't know. Dada was my mother's mother. She lived next door with her son's family in a house separated from ours by a dwarf wooden fence. Between the two houses lay our respective kitchen gardens, and I suspect there was some kind of competition between us and my uncle's household. But, overall, it was a level playing field. There were brinjels, collard greens, chilies, 
radish, pumpkin, bottle gourd, corn, cucumber, noelcal, and mountain mint. There were fruit trees in the garden as well an apple tree in ours and an apricot tree in theirs. When I was very young, I remember other fruit trees as well, but they had been cut down before a family wedding to accommodate a giant tent. Our tree produced apples of the sour variety and I remember Dada plucking one or two on sunny afternoons and then slicing them with her pocket knife, and applying salt over them with girlish delight. It must have given her immense joy and I believe it was her idea of sin the sour juice gurgling in her mouth, tingling her senses, resulting in her gently scratching her cheeks. Dada would get up early and light the fire in her hearth. She always cooked in earthen pots until she became old and her daughter-in-law took over, bringing with her steel and aluminium utensils. Dada stirred her dishes with a wooden ladle, reciting verses of Lao Ded. She was a magician with everything but I particularly remember her delicious beans and dried turnip, and dried bottle gourd and brinjels. Often Tithya, my maternal grandfather, brought guests to the house and they invariably stayed for lunch. Tithya would worry that there might not be enough food and he would steal questioning glances at Dada. She always responded with a smile. She wouldn't allow even a peep inside her vessels. No matter how many guests came, her vessels produced food. The guests would go away content, their bellies warm with tasty food. Shoba's vessels have barked, they said. My father had constructed our house next to my maternal uncle's at Ma's insistence. Their family had fled Baramola in North Kashmir during the tribal invasion of 1947. As a toddler, Ma had been carried by her 10-year-old brother on his back for miles to safety. In constructing the house, my father had exhausted his entire provident fund, whatever little jeweler my mother possessed was also sold to help finance the construction. My father often talked about how he started the first phase of construction when he had only 3,600 rupees in his pocket. The other part of the house was built by two of my father's brothers. So in one house, we had three homes. The house was built in one of the new suburbs of Srinagar. I was born a year after my parents moved to the new house. There were very few houses in our neighborhood at that time and ours didn't even have a boundary wall. Shepherds brought their flocks to graze in the open space around our house. The only theft that ever occurred was when a thief stole a bolt and a pair of old rubber slippers that belonged to my father from our veranda. There was a pair of new rubber slippers there as well, but the thief was considerate enough to leave them behind. As I was growing up, the house was also built up bit by bit. A boundary wall came up and pillars were built in the veranda. Smooth red cement was laid in the corridor and wardrobes and cupboards were built in the rooms. We also owned a black and white Weston television that took several minutes to warm up before coming to life. In those days, all of us would be excited about the feature film telecast on Doordarshan on Sunday evenings. Gradually, other families occupied the locality as well. After escaping from Baramola in 1947, most of my mother's family had relocated to have a cattle, an old locality in Srinagar named after the 16th century Kashmiri poetess Habak Khatun, who wrote beautiful verses of love and longing. My father's family came from a village in central Kashmir. My father's father was a Sanskrit scholar and he also dabbled in astrology to make ends meet. He had borne extreme hardships to raise his family. During a period of severe food scarcity in the 1950s, he had saved a sack of rice from a gang of robbers by jumping into a ditch overgrown with nettle grass. For days after, mud packs had to be applied to his body to provide him relief. Every morning, even in the harshest winter, he would wake up in the ambrosial hours and walk to the shrine of our family goddess and recite the Durga Saptashadi. Everything in my grandfather's house was done with extreme care as per Hindu tradition. Early in the morning, grandmother would clean her kitchen, applying a paste of mud and dried straw over its walls for purification. No onions or garlic were allowed. Often, my grandfather would invite home the sadhus and ascetics and scholars who came to the Keshur Bhavani shrine from all over India. Some were believed to have supreme yogic powers one of them, it was said, 
could pull out his intestines from his mouth, wash them and push them back in. Grandfather was particularly fond of an ascetic from Bengal who visited the valley in the summer. He would sit on a straw mat, speak very little, and would only drink a glass of sugarless milk. I have faint memories of him talking to me. One summer he did not return and we never saw him again. Grandmother was betrothed to grandfather at the age of 13. She would remember those days with a faint smile on her lips, of how difficult it was to cope with her father-in-law, who was a widower and prone to opium-induced aggression, and would come home late in the night and demand a curry of dried fish spicy enough to set the rice afire. In father's village, many things could be obtained through the barter system. The family grew patty and kept some cows as well. Often, fishermen, plying their shikaras along the small river that flowed past the house, would give fish in exchange for rice. Food was easy to come by in villages. But in the city, it was harder. After finishing school, father had to stay with his aunt in Srinagar to attend college. It was difficult to feed an extra person. Often, my father said, he would buy a sesame bagel from the baker, moisten it with water and eat it for lunch. In those days the results of the board exams would be declared on the radio. The day father's higher secondary exam results were to be declared, he sat glued to it. But they wouldn't announce his name. Distraught, he thought he had failed. But it turned out to be a mistake. Afterwards, at his father's insistence, my father joined government service and worked with the irrigation department. It was in the city that my parents met and later got married. Around that time, there was tension in the valley. Riots had broken out over an episode of a pundit girl marrying a Muslim boy. The pundits had risen in a rare gesture and launched an agitation. On the day my parents got married, curfew had been declared in some parts of the valley. After the wedding ceremony, the newlywed couple arrived at my father's village in Atanga. It had rained earlier, and there was muddy slush all around, and heaps of dried straw had to be put on the road to enable the bride from the city to walk without getting her shoes soiled. For years my mother would taunt father about that particular evening. Ma was hard working. She would often carry dirty utensils in sub-zero temperatures to wash them under a tap in a corner of the street in Havocatl where she lived with her parents before marriage. She was also known to have climbed up on the tin roof of their house wearing her brother's duck back gumboots to shovel down the snow lest the roof collapsed under its weight a feat that only the most courageous men could achieve. It was this spirit that led her to start working right after completing her education, choosing not to be a housewife. She served in the state health department. One of my earliest memories is of her wearing a red sweater with a floral pattern. It was much later that I came to know it was a gift from my father, who had ordered it from a Ritzer through a visiting cousin. For years, I think, the image of India for an ordinary Kashmiri was restricted to Punjab to a Ritzer and Lidiyana. Kashmiris went to Delhi, or Bombay, or Calcutta, but any non-Kashmiri was a Punjabi for them. For many years after their marriage, my parents served in far-flung villages where people were so innocent that some of them believed that the Hindu Nationalist Party, the Jansan, was a demon that pounced upon hapless people were they to be found alone in the fields. Sometimes father and ma would come to the city and watch movies at the Palladium Cinema old films with soulful Mukesh and Rafi songs. One of my mother's favorites was a song from Awara where Nargis wished that the moon would turn its face away from them for a moment so that she could love Raj Kapoor. I often found her humming this song to herself at home. I was born at a time when double-decker buses had just been introduced on certain routes and I vaguely remember that a ride from Lal Chowk to our locality would cost 25 paisa. My sister had been born six years earlier. The clock tower in the main square in Srinagar intrigued me since it looked so ancient and never kept the correct time. It stood like an old patriarch in the middle of the city. It was next to this clock tower that Jawaharlal Nehru had climbed atop a table, along with Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, and had spoken about India's commitment to Kashmir and its people. In the early 80s, I remember visits to the ancient Shankaracharya temple built on a hill overlooking Srinagar city. 
The temple was named after the Hindu philosopher Saint Adi Shankaracharya, who is believed to have visited the temple in the 9th century. We also visited the shrine of Kashmir's patron goddess Sharika inside the Hari Parbat fort. On bus on Panchami, we would go for day-long excursions to the Ramchandra temple in Srinagar. My mother's sister lived near the cantonment area, and my uncle was a movie buff. Hoping to catch a glimpse of some film stars, my uncle would seat me on the crossbar of his bicycle and ride to the Oberai Hotel, where most film stars stayed. He was so fond of movies that he would often sit all night long in front of the television, keeping the volume low, smoking Panama cigarettes and noting down the cast with a pencil on a wall next to him. I was amazed by his skill in recognizing old film actresses, Nimi, Sureya, Gita Bali, Binarai, Nalini Jagvant. It was the time when the actress the Basum would appear on television with a rose in her hair, hosting a film-based program. I also remember watching the singer Hemant Kumar on her show, a shawl placed neatly on his left shoulder, his head tilted towards the right as he sang one soulful song after another. Besides these outings and the Sunday evening feature film on television, the only source of entertainment was listening to stories from our grandparents. And then there were family gatherings and festivals. Being Shaivites followers of Lord Shiva the most important among our festivals was Shivaratri, which would be celebrated over a period of one week or so. It falls in either February or March, during the severe cold. Preparations would begin a month earlier. The whole house would be thoroughly cleaned and the larder replenished. Two days before the festival, father and I would visit Habo cattle to buy puja paraphernalia from Kunthju, a toothless man who ran a small shop as ancient and mysterious as its owner. From there, we would go to the Muslim potter who sold us earthen pots, and the shivling for rituals. Then we would make our way to the bridge one of the eight built across the Jalam and bargain with the fishermen for the best rates. We would return home, father, and I, while I held his hand in a bag of roasted chestnuts. At home, father would clean the fish in a basin and scrape off the scales under a tap beside the kitchen garden, while I watched in fascination as he cut open its guts and sliced the fish into pieces. We children would wait for the fish bladders to be extricated so that we could jump on them, making them produce a noise while bursting. I would then help father make round thrones for sh round thrones for Shiva and his bride straw from dried straw. On the evening of the festival, an area in the kitchen would be cleared to conduct the marriage rituals. The seat of prominence would be given to Parvati, represented by an earthen pitcher. It would be filled with water and the choicest walnuts and sugar cones. Its neck would be decorated with marigold and vulpatra strings, vermilion mixed with clarified butter and silver foil. The rituals lasted till midnight. As children we would struggle to remain awake till the marriage was solemnized. The next day, scores of lamb, fish, and vegetable dishes would be prepared, and the elders would give money to the children to buy anything we wanted. During the day, the men gambled at cards while the children played jump talk, a game played with cowries. They symbolized fertility and playing with them was an old practice because of the dwindling population due to religious persecution and high infant mortality rates. The cowries were procured from Bombay by a pundit family that had settled hundreds of years ago in Bajalta near Jammu. From there, the shells would be transported to the valley on mules. On the final evening of the festival, the bride and the groom would be bid farewell. Taken to the river, they would be immersed in its waters. Upon returning, the custom was for the farewell party to knock on the main door of the house. A family member would inquire who was at the door, and one of the members of the farewell party would respond, I've brought with me money, food, prosperity, and happiness. It was then that the door would be opened and the farewell party welcomed back. Then walnuts from the pitcher, sweetened with milk and sugar, would be eaten along with rotis made of rice flour cooked on a slow fire. Sometimes it snowed during Shivaratri, and we would make snowmen in our garden. We had an unwavering belief in our gods and in our festivals. During Afghan rule in Kashmir, the governor, Jabbar Khan, upon hearing that it invariably snowed on Shivaratri, ordered that it be celebrated in June, July. 
But even on that night, due to some unusual atmospheric cooling, snowflakes fell, silencing the vicious. Vidyam Dehi Sarasvati. O goddess of learning, grant me knowledge. Under the apple tree that stood in our garden, like a sage doing penance, grandfather made me recite this hymn after him. He told me how, when I was an infant, he had dipped a wooden nib in honey and written on my tongue one syllable that would guide my life, O.M. It was the key to all secrets, he said, that I ever wished to have unraveled. It was an antidote to all poisons that would try to ride on my breath. It would keep rabid dogs away from me and, likewise, Rochik, the willow the wisp the one with the bowl of fire placed on his head who misled people towards doom when the earth was covered with snow. Its recital would bar bad thoughts from polluting my mind, it would keep me from harm's way, no matter what shape or form it took. One room in our house was dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge. Its wooden shelves were lined with books, some of them covered with brown paper. The complete works of Swami Vivekananda. Arabian Nights. Kalhana's Rajadarangini. Gandhi's The Story of My Experiments with Truth. Tagore's Gitanjali. Funishbar Nath Renuzishalus. The Collected Stories of Premchand and Sadat Hassan Manto. These would be brought our day in particular day in spring, and worshipped. The night before, Ma would fill a brass plate with grains of rice over which she placed a pen, a portrait of the goddess, some milk in a small bowl, and a bunch of Narcissus flowers. The next morning we were required to first look at this offering that was how we welcomed the coming of the new year, praying that we acquired a few more droplets from the ocean of knowledge. Vidyam Dihi Sarasvati. Apart from these old customs, there was a thumb rule that guided our lives. You could say it was a story the moral of which was left unsaid, deliberately, I think. It was too evident, too stark for even a dimwit to miss. The story went like this, two boys got into a verbal duel in downtown Srinagar. It turned into a fist fight and, in no time, the two lay on the road, with one boy overpowering the other. As he lay over him, the stronger boy's sacred thread which identified him as a pundit, became visible. Bloody hell, you are a pundit. Shouted one boy. In a moment, the tables turned and it was the other boy who won the fight. The fact that his opponent was a pundit gave the other boy strength. Nobody was expected to lose to a Kashmiri pundit in a physical fight. No one knew exactly when this apocryphal fight had occurred. I had heard this story many times from men who belonged to my grandfather's generation and from those of my father's generation as well. It had probably trickled down, this piece of wisdom, from generation to generation. I didn't read much into the story as a child, but I remember creating quite a scene after hearing my parents discuss my thread-wearing ceremony. Why, son? My grandfather pulled me onto his lap. All of us have done it. My father, me, your father, and now you. This is what distinguishes us, and makes us who we are, Brahmins. He tried to reason it out with me. My groans grew louder and I flailed my arms. All right, tell me why you don't want us to put the Janu around your shoulder? He finally asked. I remained silent for a while. And then I said it. Because... Then Tarek will know that I'm a pundit and he will overpower me. I don't quite remember how Grandfather reacted to what I said. Perhaps he laughed as he always did at my childish remarks. Tarek was my friend in school. A photo of the class of 1984 I once possessed showed him next to me, his arm over my shoulder. It was the same year that the school magazine had a portrait of the goddess Sarasvati on its front page. On the afternoon of the day the magazine was distributed among the students, some of us were playing cricket on the school grounds. In the classroom, Tarek and I were inseparable, thick as thieves, as our English teacher said. But on the playground we were arch enemies he was Javed Mayandad, the famous Pakistani batsman, while I was Kapil Dev, the great Indian fast bowler. With a tennis ball and a bat made of a broken wooden plank, we would put up the fight of our lives. Most days, Tarek's side won, but that day it was my turn. 
On the last ball, bowled by Tarek himself, I hit a sixer. My team won the match. Later, on my way back to the classroom, I saw a group of my classmates standing in a circle. India won the match, I shouted. They would be crestfallen, I knew, since all of them supported Tarek's team, which called itself Pakistan. They would all hurl abuses when the national anthem was sung during the school assembly and kick those of us who sang it. One of them looked at me, and then all of them ran away suddenly, throwing a bunch of papers onto the floor. I thought my victory had embarrassed them. But what were the papers they had left behind? I picked one up, and recoiled in disgust the paper was covered with snot. I threw it away. It was then that my eyes fell on another partially crumpled paper. A shiver ran through my body. It was a page torn from the school magazine. It was the portrait of the goddess Sarasvati. It was covered with snot too. My heart sank and my stomach felt as if someone had punched me. I was very scared. I thought the goddess would punish me for my friend's behavior. Vidyam Dehi Sarasvati. No more. I raced out towards the grounds to report the incident to Tarek. I ran through one corridor and entered another. At one end in semi-darkness, I saw Tarek, his head bent over something. I slowed down. He didn't notice me. It was then that he tore off something from what lay on his lap and brought it towards his face. Tarek. I called out. He was startled. The page fell from his hands. He got up and just ran away. I prayed that it wouldn't be what I thought it was. I was paralyzed, unable to move. After what must have been a minute, I finally walked towards the page. I didn't have to pick it up. The goddess's musical instrument the Vino was clearly visible. I kept staring at it, transfixed. It was when the school bell rang that my trance broke. I lifted the page, carefully folded it, and put it in the pocket of my shorts. I didn't tell anyone about this incident. Tarek avoided me for many days. Afterwards, when he spoke to me, I tried to avoid thinking of that day. He never mentioned it either. We got back to our respective roles in the playground. But I don't remember us putting our arms around each other ever again. Sometimes, glimpses of Kashmir are shown on the Discovery Channel. One day father spotted the Dell Lake, and he almost shouted, Pointing it out to my niece, look, this is where Nadra comes from. He had forgotten that the lotus stem we sometimes bought in Delhi might have been grown in the polluted Yamuna waters, for all we knew. But I didn't say anything. My parents shifted to Delhi from Jammu in 1998, a year after getting my sister married. Three weeks before they shifted, Ma paid me her first visit in Delhi. I went to receive her at the interstate bus terminus, she refused to travel by train, which she found filthy. In the auto rickshaw, on our ride home, she had a good look at me and her eyes moistened. I was working for a television news channel at that time and kept long hours, often skipping meals. I had lost weight and this made her unhappy. You have grown so thin, she said. Girls here like slim boys, I quipped. But Ma was not one to appreciate humor. I hope some Punjabi girl has not cast her spell on you, she said with genuine worry. She spent three days in Delhi, and I took her around to show her the sights. I also bought her cool fi, which she relished. I knew that, unlike my father, for whom a proper meal had to include rice, Ma relished hot, crispy tandoori rotis. So we ate at a small clean restaurant where she had two rotis with a bowl of dal and cauliflower. One Monday morning, three weeks after Ma's visit Monday was my day off and they knew it my parents landed up at the doorstep of my one room flat. I was surprised to see them and shocked to see the number of items they had brought along with them. I was not even sure so many things would fit into my room. But in two hours, Ma had set up a kitchen. From the Kashmir Valley, we had been forced to shift to Jammu. And now, from Jammu, my parents had come to Delhi. The day after, when I returned from work close to midnight, I saw father pacing in the balcony. 
There were no cell phones then, and he didn't have my office numbers. That is why I had been dissuading you from shifting here, I said before he could complain. Father remained silent. Eat your food, Ma said. She had cooked some of my favorite Kashmiri delicacies. It took my parents months to come to terms with my grueling work schedule. Sometimes, when I returned home visibly tired, Ma would ask, So, how much do you earn? After I told her, she would say, Sit at home, I'll give you a thousand more than that. Gradually, they became used to it. So much so that if I got home early, they would ask if all was well. Wherever we went, moving from one flat to another, father forged friendships with vegetable vendors, owners of daily utility stores, and with electricians and plumbers. Wherever we lived, few knew me by my name. They only referred to me as Pandit Asahab's son. Every few months my parents would go to Jammu to catch up with relatives who had settled there after the exodus of 1990. After Ma permanently took to her bed, in 2004, they were unable to return. So, our only contact with the family is on the phone or when relatives come to Delhi for short visits. When they come from Jammu, my relatives bring with them souvenirs from home, collard greens, raw walnuts, or sesame bagels made by Kashmiri bakers who have now set up shop in Jammu. Sometimes father forgets that he is not even in Jammu now, that he is even further away from home. So he sometimes refers to Jammu as Shahar, or City Shahar was always meant to refer to Srinagar. That is a habit my father's generation has, calling Srinagar Shahar the city that is home. And when I gently remind father of his mistake, he smiles an embarrassed smile. But for days afterwards, he goes silent. For days, he does not read the newspapers. For days, he does not watch Dordarshan Kashmir and hum along with Rashid Hafiz. I can only imagine what images the mere mention of Shahar evokes in him. Shahar was our home. Shahar was our Sharagar jugular. Shahar was us. In Shahar though, by the age children learned the alphabet, they realized that there was an irreversible bitterness between Kashmir and India, and that the minority pundits were often at the receiving end of the wrath this bitterness evoked. We were the punching bags. But we assimilated noiselessly, and whenever one of us became a victim of selective targeting, the rest of us would lie low, hoping for things to normalize. But Shahar was also about friendships, bonding, compassion, and what the elders called liyas, which, in simple terms, means consideration. But in the Kashmiri context, it was many things. It was throwing away a cigarette if one spotted an elder approaching. It was offering a seat in the bus to a woman from one's locality. It was taking a heavy bag from an old man's hand and carrying it till his house. Sometimes during a summer sunset, when the sky turned crimson, serene old men taking leisurely puffs from their hookahs would look at it and then sigh and say, there has been kunrise bloodshed somewhere. On Idol Zuha, we would go to our neighbors' homes to wish them happiness. One of my father's Muslim friends lived nearby, and when father would be out on long official tours, he would stop by, knocking gently at our door, refusing to come inside, and asking if we needed anything. My sister sometimes taught his children, and on Idol Zuha I would slip out and visit his house to watch their family sacrifice sheep. A piece of lamb's meat would later be sent to us, uncooked because some families avoided eating at each other's house for religious considerations. Though, by the time of my father's generation, these considerations had almost been dissolved. Our neighbors wished us on shiver a try, and we would offer them walnuts soaked in sweet milk and water. We hardly knew of life beyond Kashmir. I remember a cousin had gone to Mira to study agricultural science. On returning, he would tell us how common murders were there, and I remember how a hush fell when he recounted how a man had been called out of his home late in the night and then stabbed. In the valley, the biggest crime we had heard about was how in a fight sometimes a man would pull out his kangri from underneath his fur and hurl it at his opponent. When somebody fought or used foul language, he would be immediately dubbed a handsy a member of the boatman community, 
known for their crude language and whose wives apparently fought bitterly. But this Leah is, this peaceful coexistence, would be threatened every now and then. It was as if the minority pundits were to be blamed for everything that went wrong. It could be anything, as our experience would tell us. In 1986, major anti-pundit riots broke out in Anantnag in southern Kashmir in retaliation to rumors that Muslims had been killed in the Hindu-majority region of Jammu. Some believed the riots were a conspiracy by one political party to bring down another party's government. Whatever the reasons, the pundits became the target. Houses were looted and burnt down, men beaten up, women raped and dozens of temples destroyed. A massive statue of the goddess Durga was brought down in the ancient Lok Bawan temple. A few years earlier, in our locality, a few pundit families had tried to construct a small temple out of wooden planks. Although there was a temple nearby, during the harsh winters the snow would make it difficult to walk on the road, so some families thought of building a temple closer to their homes. But as soon as the planks were assembled and the idols placed on a small, wooden platform, some Muslim men gathered and began to hurl abuses. One of them brought the whole structure down with a kick. There was no protest. We had learned to live that way. Whenever things went sour, we would just lower our heads and walk away. Or stay at home, till things got better. I remember visiting the site a few hours later when some of the pundit families were carrying away their desecrated gods. I was heartbroken at the sight of a broken idol of Hanuman. For us children, he was like Superman. We would sing his praises in the form of the Hanuman Kalisa. I returned home and hid myself in a patch of our garden, and lay there, face down. I must have stayed like that for a few hours till Tatha came looking for me. Tatha was Tithya's younger brother, and he lived alone in a small room in his brother's house. Tatha turned me over onto my back and I held him tight. They broke the temple, I said. He was silent for a while. And then he spoke. You know, Swami Vivekananda his photo is in Artho Kurkuth he came to the Keshur Bhavani temple many years ago and spent a few days alone there. While performing a yagna, he had a vision of the goddess. Mother, he addressed her, I am so disturbed. Everywhere I see temples being destroyed by Muslim invaders. That is when the goddess spoke to him. It doesn't matter if they enter my temple and desecrate my idol. It should not matter to you. Tell me, do you protect me, or do I protect you? Tatha then held my hand and led me to his small room. From the pocket of his Nehru jacket, he pulled out a stick. I got this for you, he said. What? You got me a stick. I cried. He smiled. Bite into it. I did as instructed and was overjoyed. I had never tasted sugar cane before. Tatha was like that full of surprises. God knows where he had got that sugar cane from, since it was not grown in the valley. The dose of sugar calmed me down, and I soon forgot about the incident. But I think it changed me a little and I became conscious of my identity as a Kashmiri pundit. A few weeks later, my paternal grandfather came to visit us for a few days. He was quite old now and spent most of his time in prayer. Even when we children created bedlam while playing around him, he would not even raise an eyebrow. One day I stopped playing and sat next to him while he recited his prayers. I waited patiently, and as soon as he finished and opened his eyes, I asked him what prayer he was reciting. Durga Saptashadi, he replied. Is it the same one that is supposed to have so much energy that some people lose their mental balance while reciting it? Yes, that is the one. So how come you can recite it and nothing happens to you? He laughed and said, I don't know, son. Maybe one has to prepare oneself for it. It has taken me years to ready myself. So teach me how to recite it, won't you? No, son, you are young right now. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of discipline. You don't even bathe every day. When you grow up, I'll teach you. I threw a tantrum. I insisted that until my grandfather taught me how to recite the mantra, I wouldn't eat. 
Nobody took me seriously at first. But when I did not eat the whole day, father got angry and stormed into my room. Don't be a fool, come and eat. I was quite afraid of him, but that day I held my ground. In the evening, Ma said grandfather wanted to see me. Okay, I will teach you a portion of it, he said. And he did. I practiced it for days and learned it by heart. My faith in what grandfather taught me that day has never wavered. I've tested that mantra in the most adverse moments of my life. And it has never failed me. Tatha lived in a small room on the first floor, overlooking the kitchen garden. Though he lived with his brother's family, he was fairly independent. He washed his own clothes and refused to use modern detergents, using instead a crude soap he got from the Katrai shopkeepers in Maharaj Ganje. He ate frugally and was not fussy about what he ate. He was a chain smoker, and in the evening he would come to our house and Ma would give him tea in a steel tumbler. He never used a cushion and always sat erect with his right leg resting on his left. I think in the evenings he felt a little lonely. My uncle worked as a teacher and was posted in distant villages for long periods, and my aunt would be busy in the kitchen. Whatever spare time she had, she liked to spend with her friends in the neighborhood. The two children went to college and had no time to spare either. So Tatha came to us in the evenings and told stories about his postings in Ladakh and Gilgit to my father who always listened patiently to him. He had served in these places before independence. Later he worked in the chest disease hospital in Srinagar. Tatha had diabetes and one day I asked him what that meant. That means there is sugar in my urine, he said. I had seen him pissing sometimes beside a shrub behind their house. After he said that, I went several times to that spot, hoping to find grains of sugar. Tatha used to pamper us. Every day he brought us something new in a junta fountain pen, a toy pistol, a packet of lotus seeds, a roll of Poppins candy, amyl milk chocolate, digestive pills, Ilayachi flavored toffees. Behind our house was stationed a battalion of the Border Security Force, BSF, and sometimes we crossed the barbed wire and sneaked into steel shuttlecocks after the officers had played their game of badminton. In the mornings and evenings, the soldiers sounded the bugle and we children would imitate its sound. Sometimes, mother would take us to a wedding feast. A huge tent would be erected, and inside, Long strips of white cloth laid on the ground and guests seated on either side of them. Two boys would come bearing a basin of water, a cake of soap, and a towel for the guests to wipe their hands with. Then, one by one, men who were relatives or friends or neighbors of the bride or groom, would come with brass plates, and then dishes of food and rice. The quantity of food put on one's plate depended on one's age, with the elders receiving the most generous helpings. The head cook would come out last, doling out portions of the main dish. If there was an important guest like a son-in-law he would be accorded special treatment, which often meant someone from his wife's family would hover around him, instructing the men who carried the meat dishes to put additional helpings on his plate. At our marriages, Muslim women celebrated with us by linking their arms and singing traditional songs to welcome the groom and his family and friends. My mother's best friend was Shazid. She also worked with the health department. They traveled together to distant villages for work, and shopped together, and exchanged gossip, and bitched about their mothers-in-law. Kashmiris have a way with nicknames. In old Srinagar, there lived a man called Javaharlal who was a fan of Sartre and would always be seen carrying one of his books. His neighbors named him Javi Sartre. In Habakadal, there lived an eccentric professor who had been named Dini Philosopher, the professor's name, I believe, was Dina Nath. The locals said he was often to be seen on the bridge mumbling mathematical equations to himself. One of them supposedly went like this, I'm on bridge, bridge is on water, bridge bridge cancel, I'm on water. My parents were protective, and I think their lives revolved around their home and the welfare of their children. There are sepia pictures of my parents enjoying day-long picnics at the Mogul Gardens. In some of them, 
My father sports a Devon and Puff while Ma wears a sari like the dazzling Vahiva Remen. But after we were born, their entire focus shifted to our education and well-being. Whatever money was saved was spent on the house. Ma ran the affairs of the house like a seasoned manager. She knew exactly what was kept where dried chilies, woolen socks, coal powder, candles. After office, many men would typically go to a bar to have a drink discreetly and then savor lamb mince kebabs at roadside stalls in Lao Chauk. These were made by Muslims, and some pundits found it a little embarrassing to be spotted in front of these stalls. So, they would place their order quickly and then stand in a corner, as if waiting for something else. Once the kebabs were made, the man signaled, and the pundit would come and quickly gobble them up. But father returned home at six on the dot, ringing the fish-shaped bell that I had chosen, and my sister and I would rush to receive him at the door. He would come inside, change, and drink his tea and talk to Ma. I remember once Ma and her entire family had gone to Baramola for a cousin's wedding. My sister and I stayed back with father. In the afternoon, he got us dressed and said that we were going to watch a movie. We took an autoric shot to the Broadway cinema where they were showing Hero. Back in school, some classmates had already seen it and had begun to sport red headbands as Jackie Shroff had done in the film. We reached the cinema hall well in time, but the queue for tickets had spilled out onto the main road and by the look of it we knew that we had no chance. Wait, I'll go to Modi Lal, he will surely manage, father said. Modi Lal lived on our street and was the manager of the cinema. Father got us a soft cone each and asked us to wait for him. After a while he returned, empty-handed. Did you get the tickets? I asked him. He said nothing. After a minute he told us that Modi Lal had seen him but had turned his head away. Father understood that he was avoiding him. He must have realized that my father might ask him for help with tickets. So father returned without talking to him. Are we to go back without watching the film? I asked. Oh no, never, he said. Have faith. We waited and after a while a shady looking man passed by. Father went after him, and from a distance we saw him speaking to the man. I almost shouted when I saw him handing over the pink slips that I knew were tickets to my father. He had bought the tickets in black. He held our hands and in no time we were inside the hall with popcorn and gold spot, watching Jackie Shroff with his red headgear, performing stunts on his motorbike. That day my father became my hero. In early 1984, one name came up repeatedly during after-dinner conversations between my father and my two uncles Ben Dranwell. From what I gathered, he was some kind of Sikh leader and had taken control of the Golden Temple in Amritsar. My mother often raved about the Golden Temple, it was the only place she had visited outside Kashmir. She had very fond memories of visiting it and more than anything else, she had been impressed with the cleanliness of the entire complex. It was a hot day in June 1984 when the news began to trickle in that something dangerous was happening in Amritsar. The Indian Army, we learned, had attacked the temple to get rid of Bindranwale. Mother was said to see the desecration. She kept describing how the temple looked from inside and how peaceful one felt there while the Sikh priests sang the soulful Gurbani. That evening, one of father's friends came by and told us that in retaliation to the army operation, a mob had descended upon the Hanuman temple in Amira cattle and thrown the idol into the Jalam. The priests were beaten up as well. I couldn't understand why the Hanuman temple had been targeted for what had transpired hundreds of miles away, events in which Kashmir had no role to play. It was in October of the same year that Indira Gandhi, who many held responsible for the assault on the Golden Temple, was assassinated by her Sikh bodyguards. I had skipped school that day for some reason and in the afternoon we heard the news on All India Radio that the Prime Minister had been shot, and that she was in critical condition. It was later in the day that the BBC finally declared her dead. The radio had begun to play the mournful Shanae. My sister returned from school in tears that day. She said there had been celebrations in her school and on the streets. 
The previous year Mrs. Gandhi had visited Kashmir and she had addressed a rally in Iqbal Park where men sat in the front row naked, waving their genitals at her. It is not that we were traditional Congress supporters, or for that matter followers of politics. I don't remember anyone in my family stepping out on election days. They had neither the time nor the inclination for it. But for us, Indira Gandhi represented the emotional connect we felt with India, or more specifically with Jawaharlal Nehru, who we thought of as one of our own. In Delhi, the anti-Sikh riots began soon after Mrs. Gandhi was declared dead. From the Indian Express, we learned the horrific details of how scores of innocent people were done to death for no fault of theirs. One day, something similar will happen here, to us, one of my uncles said. Five days after Mrs. Gandhi's death, Dada passed away too, in her sleep. She had begun to hallucinate about a person who she said was aiming at her with a gun from atop a tree in the backyard. Dada's death came as a big blow to Tatha. Tithya had died years ago, and so did Ah, his sister-in-law, had been Tatha's only companion. A year later, my paternal grandfather passed away as well. Ma had been visiting, and that night she, and that night she asked father not to lay any elaborate bedding at home. She had a premonition of grandfather's death. At midnight, we were woken up. Grandfather's body was brought home in an ambulance. The children of the house were made to put water into grandfather's mouth with a spoon, and then we were sent to Tatha's house for the night. The following morning, grandfather was taken on his final journey. As my father and uncles lifted up his beer, I silently recited the prayer he had taught me not very long ago. I don't know what Shahar means to me personally. In so many ways, we were protected in Shahar from the trickery and the treachery of big cities like Delhi. In Shahar, as I realized later, speaking one's own language meant so much. It filled one with contentment and an undefinable happiness. From the late 1990s onwards, years after the exodus, when I went to the valley on reporting assignments, it was as if a tap opened up suddenly. Kashmiri words did a foxtrot on my tongue and I uttered them words that I had forgotten even existed. Once, in the dead of the night, when nobody was out on the streets except army convoys, I sneaked out from my hotel with a few local friends and sat on a wooden deck that extended out over the Dell Lake. A radio crackled somewhere in one of the houseboats, and the Hazrat Ball Shrine shimmered in the still waters of the lake. A lone light, perhaps from a sentry post, shone from the Hari Parbat Fort. We sat there, taking swigs from a bottle of old monk rum and laughed over a tragicomic incident a friend was narrating. A few years ago, early one morning, hundreds of army troopers surrounded a village. They said they were looking for militants. This was in the early 2000s, and by then the Kashmiris were quite used to the humiliation of being made to assemble in a ground while soldiers conducted searches inside houses. Such search operations the Kashmiris called them crackdowns would sometimes last for the entire day. In this village the men were made to assemble in a school ground. They sat on their haunches while soldiers, wearing bulletproof jackets and helmets, kept a watch on them. A man had the urge to shit, and it made him restless. He looked at the soldier hovering over him, held his chin, that is how Kashmiris ask for a favor, and muttered, Sahab. Gusa Aira hai. Now, in Kashmiri, Gus means shit, and in Hindi, Gusa means anger. The man thought by adding an a, a Kashmiri word could turn into a Hindi one. It did, but unfortunately it meant something else now. The soldier let out an expletive and almost hit the man on his head. Bastard, he shouted, we have not been here for five minutes and you are already feeling angry. It was then that the man's neighbor pitched in to explain his friend's predicament. Sahab, he begged, he doesn't know Hindi. He means, usko gobare ayahai. Gobar in Hindi means dung. He must have remembered some school essay on the cow. The soldier's rifle slipped off as he collapsed on the ground with uncontrollable laughter. While we laughed as well, the story also filled my heart with sadness and I was sure it saddened my friends as well. 
they had to live through this every day. But we did not share sadness beyond this. Because then the topic always veered towards the events of 1989 to 90, and that was the point at which our truths became different. For them, the events of 1990 were a rebellion against the Indian state. For me, these same events had led to exile and permanent homelessness. When I visited we laughed most times, and sang songs, and hugged each other. Sometimes we just sat quietly, and at times like these, even the crackle of burning cigarette paper could be heard. At times like these I remembered a girl. When we were still in the valley, at home, one of my distant cousins ended her life by jumping into the jalam. At first she was thought to have gone missing, and there were rumors of her having eloped with her lover. Apparently, for weeks before she disappeared, she had sat in a corner of her house, listening to a Rashid Hafiz song. Yeli Chimaya Namak Barsajawak, Pana Push Tabak. Asmonic Tarak Gans Ravak, Pana Push Tabak. You will repent only when you decorate my grave. You will count stars in the sky, this is how you will repent. They found her bloated body a week or so later in the river waters somewhere far away. Since I was young, I was not allowed to attend her cremation. I had met her for the first time when grandfather passed away and her family stayed with us through the days of rituals. I had played cricket with her younger brother and spent hours looking at her in secret admiration of her nail paint and of the lipstick she had in the pocket of her furin and of her diary in which she had copied verses of Rumi. Her death left some indelible mark in my heart, some sort of pain as if she had jumped into the jalam to meet me and I was not there to save her, to rescue her. She must have been very lonely, or in love, or both. For years afterwards, whenever I thought of homelessness, or when I heard singers at marriage ceremonies, I always remembered her. I thought of the spot from where she must have met the waters of the Jalam. I also remembered a moment when she winked at me from behind the staircase of my home, where she sat writing something in her diary, and how she then kissed me on my cheek. Her memory always makes that dull throbbing pain return the pain of being in exile. During summers in the valley, we would shift to the first floor of our house. I didn't quite understand the logic, but I believe it was to take advantage of the cool breeze that blew during the nights. In Kashmir, no ceiling fans or refrigerators were required. A table fan was good enough. You returned from outside and sat in front of the fan till it dried off your sweat. That was it. On hot summer nights, you kept the windows open and wrapped yourself in thin white bed sheets. On one such night, I had a nightmare. It must have been 1987. I saw that the space between my uncle's house and ours that was where our kitchen gardens were was infested with sword-wielding marauders who wore sandals made of dry straw. That was how grandfather had described the tribal invaders who entered Kashmir in 1947. In my nightmare, the marauders went on a killing spree, thrusting their bayonets and swords into people. We were scared, and we tried to hide behind a wardrobe. That was when a few marauders caught hold of Ravi. One of them plunged his sword into Ravi's abdomen and he shouted for my mother. I woke up covered with beads of sweat. It was morning already, and everyone else had awoken. I was still dizzy with fear and couldn't get up. Then I heard the sound of a motorcycle and pulled myself to the window. I was happy to see Ravi alive and riding his motorcycle perhaps to the university. I was so relieved that I shouted out to him. He didn't hear me and rode on. Ravi was my maternal uncle's son. I was very fond of him and, more than me, my mother adored him. Among Kashmiris, the women have a strong attachment to their brother's children. But in my mother's case, it was much more than that. Ravi was pursuing an emphil in botany. I never left him alone, and sometimes Ma had to drag me away from his room to give him some privacy. After all, he was a young man. For hours, he would be locked inside his room, a kangri under his fur and during the harsh winter months, listening to gazals. When I was younger, I would get jealous of Jagjit Singh and Tala disease and maul their images on the audio cassettes with the long needle Ravi used to isolate anthers from flowers. 
he would look at their mauled faces and lift me in his arms, shadow boxing with me. He never complained. Sometimes he teased me by singing a ditty he had created using my nickname. Vicky K.O. Bardu Dicky Main, Abna Kam Karga. Put Vicky in a dicky, he will do his work there. I would watch him in fascination as he went about his routine. He would shave, filling water in a while enameled cup, and I mentally made a note of the old spice aftershave he dabbed on his cheeks. Like him, I also stuck a poster of the cricketer Chris Shriek Kunth in my cupboard. Sometimes, he would give me gifts he acquired from his friends who worked in pharmaceutical companies a plastic cat from Glaxo with an outdoor thermometer fitted in its guts, or a Briffin pocket paper cutter. He had many friends, and he went out frequently with them. I would see them often sitting at a local provision store the owner was their friend. But most times he would sit in his room, listening to his beloved gazals and preparing notes and drawing botanical illustrations in his clear hand. For days, I remember, he tried to teach me how to correctly pronounce geography, and to irritate him, I would pronounce it incorrectly. It became a joke between us. When I think of those days, I reckon he must have been quite popular among girls of his age. Some of them would visit him every now and then, on the pretext of borrowing his notes or an audio cassette. He always wore jeans under his furin. When I was a little older and found the traditional checked pajamas we wore as children quite embarrassing, I understood why he did that. Of all his friends, the coal-eyed lad if loan was closest to Rubby. The whole family knew him. We used to call him John Rambo. He was tall, muscular, and always wore jeans and sneakers that he would top with a slim fit for and he had had specially stitched in the Bund area of Srinagar, famous for its tailors. Latif was a romantic and a big fan of Mohammed Rafi. He ran a small cosmetics shop called Bombay Beauties and an electronics shop. The latter did not do much business, but he still ran it thinking it would fetch him an income someday. Also, it enabled him to listen to Rafi all the time, whose songs he would play amplified through a tall speaker. I saw him often at Ravi's house, arguing about who the fastest bowler was in cricket. He also liked a cup of hot Lipton tea. In Kashmir, it was important to say what tea you wanted. Apart from the pink salt tea that most youngsters despised, there was the spiced kawa. But it was considered hep to sip on Lipton tea from bone china cups with flowery designs, just like the English did. In those days, the state-run Doordarshan television network was quite boring, so in Kashmir we would extend our TV antennas as far as possible through the roof to catch the signals of Pakistan TV. I remember they had some really nice cereals, including a few for children. We particularly enjoyed Olive Lila, based on the Arabian Nights, while the grown-ups wouldn't miss a cereal called Emergency Ward. During the harsh winters it would snow heavily and in the dead of the night we would wake up sometimes, startled by the sound of a heavy load of snow falling from the tin roof, sounding as if the sky were falling. Sometimes the snow also brought the antenna down. Ravi would then be sent to fetch Latif loan. Latif would come survey the antenna and then race up to the attic from where he would climb atop the roof to fix the antenna back into position. While clinging to the roof, he would invoke the name of a Sufi saint, Yapir Daskir. The family would meanwhile watch him from ground level, praying for his safety. Sometimes Ravi's mother would curse herself for making him do it. Treth in Pakistan TV iOS, she would lament. To hell with Pakistan TV. Latif would ask Ravi to straighten the antenna pole, look left and then right, as if offering namas, and finally fit the antenna. Now I want a cup of Lipton tea, he would say. And so Latif would have his tea while Ravi's mother and sister sat in front of their TV to check how clear the signal had become. I would sometimes spot Latif at Lal Chowk with a girl, and sometimes they boarded the same bus as mine. And if I had a seat and they didn't, I would offer mine to the girl. She would smile and offer to seat me on her lap, but I always refused. I was 11 then, almost a teenager. I wanted to stand, as Latif did, and he would place his hand on my shoulder and it made me proud. 
Sometimes I visited his electronics shop to get songs recorded on a cassette. I had no taste for Rafi then, and would want him to record songs from films like Dance Dance and Tridev. Whenever I tried to pay him, he would take the money from my hand and put it back into my shirt pocket, whistling carelessly and breaking into some Rafi song. He sang them always. In June 1983, as a seven-year-old, I have vague memories of the Indian cricket teams winning the World Cup. It was a day, night match, I fell asleep only to be woken later by shouts of celebration. But I remember everything of October 13th, 1983. It was the day when the first ever international cricket match was played in Jammu and Kashmir. And the last, too. The Indian team and that of the West Indies arrived the day before the match and were put up in a hotel close to the Sher e Kashmir Stadium. Ravi had somehow procured two tickets for the match, and we reached the stadium quite early, walking past sniffer dogs. We took our seats on the freshly painted green benches. The two captains came down for the toss, which was won by the West Indies. They chose to field. I shouted in joy when a few minutes later Sunil Gavaskar and Chris Shrikanth entered the ground to open the batting for India. And that was when it all began. Ravi and I sat in disbelief as the stadium erupted with deafening cries of Pakistan's Indabad. Green flags, both Pakistani and the identical Jamati Islami banner, were seen being carried by people in the stadium. Many in the crowd also held posters of Pakistani cricketers. The Indian batsman looked like rabbits caught in glaring headlights. On the 16th ball he faced, Gavaskar was caught out, having scored only 11 runs. The whole team crumbled in 41 overs for a total score of 176 runs. Later, as the West Indies team batted, the Indian fielders faced severe harassment. They were booed badly. A half-eaten apple was thrown at Dilip Vengusrakar, which hit him on his back. Of course, India lost that match. Years later, as a journalist, I met the cricketer Kirti Azad at a party. Azad was a part of the Indian team that day and had hit two defiant success in a lost cause. How can I ever forget that day? He told me. It was like playing in Pakistan against Pakistan. Returning home after witnessing the madness, Ravi and I had not spoken a word. He tried to comfort me by treating me to a soft drink. The next morning, I had avoided Remen. But I also knew there would be no escaping him. Remen was our milkman. Every morning he came to our house, announcing his presence by shouting at the door. Most days, I would come out to collect the milk. We would argue with each other about cricket in Pakistan. It used to be simple banter but sometimes I would take it quite seriously. Where is he? He asked my mother when she came out that morning to collect the milk. I was hiding behind the door. Pakistan's into bed. He shouted, as if he felt my presence behind the door. My mother smiled. Tell your son that Gavaskar is a lamb in front of our Pakistani heroes, he said. I could no longer hold back. Though I was no fan of Gavaskar's, I felt I had to defend him. I stormed out to confront Remen. All your Pakistani heroes are shit scared of Chris Shrikanth, I said, on the verge of tears. There you are, he said, and he laughed. The Dal-eating Indians cannot fight Pakistan. Are you a kid like him? My mother intervened. This is war, Benet, he said and looked mockingly at me. And you? You stop watching these matches, my mother said. They mean nothing. It is just a game. But by then it was war indeed. By 1986, forced blackouts were the norm in the valley on India's Independence Day. In some places, if India won a cricket match against Pakistan, a stone could crash through one's window pane and land in the bedroom. On April 18th, 1986, India and Pakistan played against each other at Sharjah in the final of the Australasia Cup. In anticipation, I bullied Tatha into buying me firecrackers from Maharaj Ganjay. On television, 
You could see Arab sheiks in the VIP enclosure throw money in the air whenever a Pakistani batsman hit a boundary. But India managed to stay afloat. The last over. My heart was pounding against my ribcage. The last ball. Pakistan needed four runs to win. Javed Mayandad was on strike. Chetan Sharma was bowling. I had a matchbox in my hand. Sharma bowled a low full toss and Mayandad hit it for a six. The stadium erupted. Mayandad and number 11 batsman Tazif Ahmed ran to the team pavilion, jubilant. My matchbox went limp with sweat. Every combustible item in the Sharjah ground was on fire. A few minutes later, it was as if it were Diwali in Kashmir. I think every cracker available in Kashmir was burst in the next one hour. People streamed out of their houses and onto the streets chanting Allah Ho Akbar. In the nippy April weather of the valley, people drank gallons of Limka to celebrate, the way they had seen cricket stars celebrate with champagne. And I lay huddled in a corner of my house. 25 years after that episode, in 2011, when we had been in exile for more than two decades, India registered a World Cup victory. I am grown up now, and victory or defeat in a cricket match means nothing to me. But my father had tears in his eyes when India won. He looked at me expectantly. I didn't have the heart to tell him that though I don't care any longer for cricket, my feelings from 1986 remain. In more die of heartbreak, Saul Bellow calls such feelings first heart. My first heart remains with that failed Yorker bowled by Chetan Sharma. During the summer vacations, I stayed at home while my parents were at work. Ma was always visiting some village or the other. When she returned in the evenings, her handbag would be full of small tokens of gratitude given by villagers who sought treatment at her health center. Someone would fall from a walnut tree and get hurt badly. Or someone would accidentally be hurt with an axe or some other tool. Or a child would have a fever and Ma would provide the required medicine. Or an animic mother would get better because of a health supplement Ma recommended. Once they got well, the villagers would return and offer her apples, or raw walnuts, or almonds, or the juiciest of chestnuts, or a small packet of saffron. As children, we ransacked her handbag and treated ourselves to its contents. But sometimes, staying inside the house for the whole day would make me cranky. One day, out of sheer boredom, I asked Ravi if I could accompany him to the university. He sensed that I was down. Today, I have classes to attend. And anyway, there is not much to show you at the university. But why don't you be ready tomorrow morning and we will go for a small outing, he said. I was so excited that the moment Ma returned in the evening, I told her about our plans. I couldn't sleep for hours after Ma had tucked me into bed. And when I finally did, I dreamt of the next day and the fun we would have. By sunrise the next morning I was wide awake. I put on my best shirt and a pair of trousers father had bought for me from the Blue Fox garment store and I waited for Ravi to wake up. We set out in the early afternoon on his Yamaha bike. It was a bright afternoon and in no time we left the hubbub of Lal Chowk to enter the tranquil area of the Shankaracharya temple near the foothills. While riding on a long road, Ravi slowed down his bike and asked me to look far ahead. Can you see water on the road? He asked. I looked intensely but couldn't see anything. Embarrassed, I lied and said that I could. That is just an illusion. There is no water there. But in the heat one imagines that there is. It is called a mirage, Ravi explained. Oh yes, I see it clearly, I lied again. Our first stop was at the Shalimar Garden. We parked the motorcycle next to photo studios where pictures of studio owners with various film stars were displayed. Inside the garden, Ravi bought a packet of red cherries and we sat down under a tree like two old friends meeting after a long time. He told me of an Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel, who had devised the law of genetics using pea plants. He spoke of other things as well, but by that time my attention was diverted by a foreigner with green hair. She had perched herself atop a tree, and below, 
Her friend was beseeching her to climb down. But she refused, and after every minute or so, would break into uncontrollable laughter. My school friends had told me how some foreigners consumed drugs. I had no idea what they meant and what drugs really were. I had heard of how foreigners carried brown sugar. We thought sugar, if burnt in a pan, turned brown and acquired the properties of a drug. That day when I saw the green-haired woman, I thought she must have consumed brown sugar. We thought of foreigners as either very educated and cultured, Englishman type, or bohemian. We loosely termed the latter as hippies and even had a ditty for them. Janina ye job hall deco, hippie yon ke lam lam bail deco. Oh dear, look at their strange ways, look at the long hair of the hippies. From Shalimar Garden we went on to Peri Mahal and Ravi told me how it was built by the Mughal Prince Darishiko as his library. According to legend, the place was inhabited by fairies, and I remember asking Ravi many questions about their existence. At the entrance of the Shashmi Shahi Gardens, Ravi treated me to an ice cream cone. Our next stop was Nehru Park, where we hired a Shikara to take us to the middle of the Dell Lake. In Chased Kashmiri, the kind I had never heard Ravi speaking before, he bargained with the boatman. In the middle of the lake, when the waves hit the Shikara making it sway a little, my heart sank. But I showed no fear. I didn't want Ravi to think of me as a sissy. Back on Boulevard Road, we went to a small eatery and Ravi bought us hot dogs. He also asked for a bottle of gold spot for me and a thumbs up for himself. He always had thumbs up. On our way home, I urged him to speed up his bike, and he did so on some stretches. I was thrilled. I held him tightly. Four days afterwards, I would boast to my friends about Mendel, Darishiko, and the green-haired English MEM I had seen. Eleven years after that carefree day, the nightmare about Ravi I had had a few months earlier came true. It was in September 1986 that Tatha also left us. A few weeks prior to his death, on the day of Eid, he fell in his room and lost consciousness. After that, he was never able to stand on his feet. His reckless smoking had taken a toll on his lungs. His kidneys were also damaged because of excessive blood sugar. He was shifted to a bigger room on the first floor, and his bed lay beside a glass cabinet where Ravi kept his copies of India today. Tatha was shocked by his new circumstances. He barely spoke, and for hours he would stare into nothingness. We visited him every day and tried to make him as comfortable as possible. One day my aunt entered his room and found him smoking. She called my uncle and he admonished Tatha for being so callous towards his condition. They searched his belongings and found a few cigarettes underneath his pillow. They were taken away. Throughout this episode, Tatha did not utter a word. He kept his eyes closed. A day later, I crossed over the dwarf fence to see him. He smiled weakly and I asked him to place his hands on the floor and I stepped onto them. He liked to get his hands pressed like this. After a while, he looked at me and said, if I ask you to do something, will you do it? Of course, I said. Go to my room. Open the wooden trunk, you will find some money inside. Bring a 10 rupee note here to me, he said. I ran to his room and brought him the note. Now will you go and buy me two cigarettes from the shop? You can buy yourself a chocolate as well. But, listen, just get it discreetly, will you? Normally, I would have sprinted to the shop and got him what he wanted. But I remembered the previous day's episode. At the same time, I didn't want to blatantly say no to him. With the note crumpled in my fist I stepped outside and then just sat on a stone slab beside a poplar tree. I waited for a while and then went back to Tatha. Tatha, no shop is open. There is some strike today, I lied. Tatha looked at me for several seconds. And then he said a feeble okay. Keep the note with you, buy yourself whatever you want. And don't forget to share it with your sister, he said. I left, but I just couldn't bear the thought that I had lied to him. It was not that I had not lied to Tatha before. 
Sometimes he would get me a present, and it wouldn't work properly. A pen, for example. After a few days he would ask me if I liked it, and I would invariably say yes. But this time it was different. I raced towards the market. I bought two Capstan cigarettes, the brand he usually smoked, and I brought them to him. Tatha, I found the fancy provision store open, I said. He smiled. Just keep watch and alert me if someone comes up, he said. I helped him sit up and put a cushion behind his back. He lit his cigarette while I kept watch at the head of the stairs. In between, I peeped in his room and saw him taking deep puffs. His face looked peaceful. After he had finished, I threw the butt and the burnt matchstick out the window. Totha lay back on his bed. And then he mumbled a few lines from a Kashmiri verse about the birth of Krishna. When I was much younger, he would often sing that to me as a lullaby. Gat Kani Gashok Chunzangi. J. 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 Devki Nandani Y. On a moonless night, light spread on your accord. Salutations, O the beloved son of Devki. A few days later, he passed away. He was cremated where Dada and my grandfather had been cremated. In the garden that one could see through the window of his room, I built him a shrine and decorated it with marigold flowers and many chewing gum, which he had often bought for me. A few months before his death, I had asked Tatha to have his picture taken. Between Ravi's family and mine, we had many family albums. But there was not a single picture of Tatha. After I had insisted for days, he agreed and had his picture taken with him wearing his trademark kurta and standing against the backdrop of the photographer's rainbow studio curtain. After our exodus to Jammu, I searched for that photograph, hoping that it was among the few items we had managed to salvage before fleeing. But I didn't find it. In a way we were all thankful that barring my father's mother, no one from that generation had lived to experience the pain and difficulties of living in exile. It was only a few years ago that I found Tatha's picture inside some documents in my father's briefcase. It is now in my father's prayer room, along with pictures of my other ancestors. One summer night it was 1988 we awoke to noises coming from the BSF camp behind our house. By the time I got up, my father and uncles were already on the rear balcony, looking in the direction of the camp. I joined them. My father asked me to remain quiet. From there, rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I saw a young man being beaten up by a few BSF soldiers. He lay on the road, and asked for water. But all he got was kick after kick. After some time, he was forced onto his feet and led into a building. It was only the following morning when we learned what had happened. The young man's name was Gauhar and he lived in a locality near ours. He was a karate expert and we kids adored him. Apparently, a few days earlier, he had had a tiff with a BSF soldier and punched him. Later, as he passed by the main gate of the BSF camp, the soldier and his friends accosted him and brought him inside where he was beaten up and kept in confinement. The next evening an angry crowd gathered outside the camp demanding his release. The BSF relented and he was set free. I was doing my homework when I learned that Gauhar had been set free and that he had been spotted eating a bagel at a local baker's. I rushed out to meet him and shake hands with him. He was our hero, having braved the kicks of those soldiers. But when I reached the bakery, he was not there. The baker didn't know where he had gone. I rushed to Ladif's shop to find out if he knew about Gauhar's whereabouts. But his shop was closed. I had been seeing less and less of Ladif. His shop was either closed or manned by one of his friends or brothers. I asked Ravi about him. But he had no clue either. They had drifted apart a little. Ravi had been busy at the university, finishing his doctoral thesis. After graduating, he had been on the lookout for a job. Some of his friends had moved out of Kashmir to join private companies. But he did not want to leave. It was around this time that my father had a mild heart attack. My father has always been prone to stomach ailments, 
and on that day he was in the office when he experienced severe pain in his abdomen. He was rushed to a gastroenterologist who recommended an injection for immediate relief. The injection caused a bad reaction severe rashes broke out on his body and his speech turned incoherent. It was always at such adverse moments that Ma would turn into a Joan of Arc. She was normally apprehensive. She didn't let me go for school picnics to the Aharbal waterfall for fear that someone might push me into it. During winters, when we sometimes accompanied father on his official trips to Jungmu, she would switch on her pencil torch the moment the bus entered the Javahar tunnel, the only connection between the Kashmir Valley and the rest of India. During a storm she would close all the doors and windows and sit frightened in one corner, waiting for it to end. And if it lasted for long, she would look at father and ask, Do you think this will end? Father would assure her a few times, but she would keep repeating her question till it irritated father. No, this is going to last till doomsday. That day, she somehow gathered her nerves and accompanied father to the Badis Paddle, main hospital, in an autoric shock. The government hospital was crowded, and even in the emergency ward, it was difficult to find a doctor to attend to my father. As Ma ran from one counter to another, a young doctor appeared. There was a mark on his forehead, the result of offering Namus five times a day as is required of pious Muslims. Ma recalled later how the doctor had looked at father and immediately started his examination. And at that moment father had vomited. It was so severe. Ma recalls, that it even filled the doctor's shoes. But not once did he flinch. He had continued to treat my father. A day later, father was back home, although it took him a couple of weeks to recover fully. Life went on as usual. But around this time, something had begun to change. It was in the air, something you couldn't see, but could feel and smell. Ma returned home one evening from office and she looked disconsolate. She entered slowly and set down her handbag. She asked my sister to get her some water. Father had come home early that day. Are you unwell? He asked her. She didn't speak for a moment or two. And then she narrated what she had witnessed. In the bus on her way home. A man had helped an old pundit lady disembark from the bus. Another woman, who was a Muslim, lashed out at the man, reminding him that the woman he helped was a pundit and that she should have instead been kicked out of the bus. What Ma witnessed that day in the bus, we considered an aberration. Remen, meanwhile, was acting strange at times. I remember we were getting our attic renovated and he took a dig at us. Why are you wasting your money like this? He said as he poured milk from his can. Tomorrow, if not today, this house will belong to us. As usual Ma dismissed his talk. Ruby had gone on a plant collection trip to the Lolab Valley along the line of control, with his department colleagues, including one of his best friends Irshad. In the forest they were waylaid by armed men who asked if there were any Hindus in their group. Ruby was the only one and the men were told that there were none. When they asked for their names, Ravi used a fake name that identified him as a Muslim. But, even then, we still didn't realize what was to come to pass. On July 31, 1988, two low-intensity bomb blasts rocked Srinagar. One bomb had been planted outside the central telephone exchange while the other was laid outside the golf course. Followed by These were followed by other blasts. They were considered to be the handiwork of terrorists from Punjab who sneaked into Kashmir to escape the police in their area. An uncle returned after praying at the Shankaracharya temple. I saw a group of men racing up and down the stairs, he said. The same thing was happening at Hari Parbat. On the bypass road, near our house, even I saw hordes of men doing physical exercises. This had never happened before. It was only later that we realized that some of these men had been among those who had crossed over the border to Pakistan to receive arms training, and this had been a part of their fitness regimen. A bomb blast in Srinagar claimed the first pundit casualty in March 1989. Prabhavati of Chaduratagsil was killed in a blast on Hari Singh Street on March 14th. 
That month, I saw Latif one day. I was standing with father at the vegetable shop when he passed by holding a corner of a green cloth which was held on the other corners by three others. He didn't see us. He was collecting funds, he said, mosque, thing of a mosque. I looked at him. He looked haggard, his skin was rugged and his beard thicker. It was then that his eyes fell on me and he smiled. He didn't look at father. I didn't feel right in my heart. The party walked on, holding their cloth. It was from a neighbor that we heard the first rumors. He had gone to the ration shop to get sugar when he overheard a man exclaiming inshallah, next ration we will buy in Islamabad. It was around this time that bus conductors in Lal Chowk could be heard shouting Sapari, hand war, Apur. Sapari and Handwara were border towns while Apur means across. Across the line of control. It was meant as an enticement for the youth to cross over the border for arms training, to launch a jihad against India. On a hill in the Badami Bog cantonment, someone had painted JKLF. One could see it from a distance. It stood for Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front. It was rumored to be an organization of young men who had crossed over the border to receive arms training. At school we heard the word Mujahid for the first time. We knew this word. We had heard it on TV, accompanied by images of men in Afghanistan firing rockets from their shoulders. But in the context of Kashmir, it seemed out of place. What were Mujahids to do in Kashmir? On June 28, 1989, Pamphlets were distributed in Srinagar. It was an ultimatum to Muslim women, by an organization that called itself Hasbi Islami, to comply with Islamic standards within two days or face action. Pundit women were asked to put a deluxe on their foreheads for identification. On September 2nd, the 300-year-old Babareshi shrine was gutted in a fire under mysterious circumstances. On the same morning, a wireless operator of the Central Reserve Police Force, CRPF, was shot in our neighborhood. On the afternoon of September 14th, I was playing cricket in the school grounds. My side won the match, and I was about to treat myself to an orange lolly with my pocket money when I felt someone's hand on my shoulder. I turned back and saw father standing there. He smiled. Go and get your bag, we have to go home, he said. I thought something terrible had happened at home. Why, what happened? I asked. Someone has been shot in Habba cattle. The situation will turn worse. So we need to head home. That was when the first pundit fell to bullets. Some armed men had entered the house of the political activist Tycho Lal Taplu and shot him dead. The next day, father did not let me go to school. We were told that Taplu's funeral procession was pelted with stones. But barring that, nothing more untoward happened immediately after his death. I went back to school two days later. During the Hindi class, when the Muslim boys would be away for Urdu class, the pundit teacher got an opportunity to discuss the killing with us. Times are beginning to get tough, she said. That is why it is important for all of you to study with renewed vigor. In its preliminary investigation, the state police believed that Taplu's killing did not fit the pattern emerging from the activities of Kashmiri militants. Twelve days after Taplu's death, the then chief minister, Farooq Abdullah, performed a small piece of classical dance along with dancer Yamini Krishnamurti during a cultural function at the Mardan temple. A few days later, he assured people that militancy would end soon. On Eid Milad on Nabi, on October 14th, a massive crowd gathered near the Budsha Chowk in the heart of Srinagar, and from there, it marched towards Eidgah to the graveyard that had been renamed the Martyr's Graveyard. The onlookers cheered and showered Shireen on the marchers as if to welcome a marriage procession. That evening, father returned home with a neighbor and they told us they had witnessed the procession. The crowd was shouting slogans that had shocked them. Yahan Kia Kaliga, Nizami Mustafa. La Sharkia La Garbaya, Islamia Islamia. What will work here? The rule of Mustafa. 
no Eastern, no Western, only Islamic, only Islamic. Zalzala ayya haika for kay maidan main. Lo mujahidhe ayya maidan main. An earthquake has occurred in the realm of the infidels. The mujahids have come out to fight. It was indeed an earthquake. It toppled everything in Kashmir in the next few weeks. Within a few days the whole scenario changed. There was another series of bomb blasts outside other symbols of Indianness India Coffee House, Punjab National Bank, the Press Trust of India. Then the tide turned against wine shops and cinema halls. It was only much later that we were able to connect this turmoil to world events occurring around the same time. The Russians had withdrawn from Afghanistan nine years after they swept into the country. In Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini had urged Muslims to kill the author of the Satanic Verses. In Israel, a Palestinian bomber struck in a bus for the first time, killing 16 civilians. A revolution was surging across Eastern Europe, and a bloodied frenzy was about to be unleashed against the Armenian Christian community in Azerbaijan. In the midst of this chaos, my eldest uncle came from my father's village to visit us. The water in the spring at the goddess's sanctum has turned black, he whispered. This was considered to be ominous. Legend had it that whenever any catastrophe befell our community, the spring waters turned black. That it was indeed a catastrophe became clear on the night of January 19, 1990.